Hello, and thanks for joining us for our three-part webinar series, Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements. My name is Arjiro Cavada from NASA headquarters and the GEO EO4 SDG initiative. This three-part training is a collaboration between NASA's Applied Sciences Remote Sensing Training Program, the UN Habitat, the Group on Earth Observations EO4 SDG initiative, the GEO Human Planet Initiative, and the CEO's Working Group on Capacity Building and Data Democracy. First, I wanted to share a little bit more about myself. So I'm an Earth scientist working with NASA's Earth Science Division Applied Sciences Program as the Program Manager for Sustainable Development Goals. And I also serve as the Executive Director for the International GEO eo 4 stg Initiative. As part of the work that I do, I work with uh, a group of international partners and collaborators to extend earth science applications and research to advance sustainable development around the world in alignment with the sustainable development goals. First, I would like to introduce the RCET program. RCET is NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. RCET's mission is to provide accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, and tools to increase the use of Earth observations in decision-making activities. RCET offers both in-person and online trainings at a variety of levels. This allows participants to learn remote sensing based on their level of experience and need. RCET offers trainings in the following application areas, disasters, health and air quality, land management, and water resources, as well as climate. For more information, you can visit the site listed here. This training will have three parts, each being one and a half hours long on January 27, February 3rd, and February 10th. The sessions will consist of lectures and demonstrations, each followed by a question and answer session. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here, and after each part, the recording can be found here too. There are two prerequisites for this training. First, you must have an understanding of the basics of remote sensing, with our course on those concepts listed here if you're not familiar. Also, it is recommended that you have attended or watched the materials from the training we held last spring on an introduction to population grids and their integration with remote sensing data for sustainable development and disaster management. This training will be delivered in English and Spanish, so if you're more comfortable attending the Spanish version, we will conduct that session later today, and you can find the registration link through the link found in the chat. For this series, we will have one homework assignment. The link to the homework will be made available during the last session and will be due on Tuesday, February 24th. The homework will be a Google form that you submit online. If you attend all three parts and complete the homework by the deadline, you will receive a certificate of completion. Please be patient as it takes a couple of months to process and send out these certificates. The objectives for this training series are to understand the value and usefulness of Earth observations to monitor and report on urban sustainable development goal indicators in the new urban agenda. Learn from inspiring examples of cities using Earth observations for Sustainable Development Goal 11 and the new urban agenda. Understand how to apply Earth observation-based toolkit resources to enhance urban resilience and improve decisions regarding planning, including informal settlements, open spaces for public use, access to public transport and urban greening. Monitoring such as for air quality or land consumption and operational preparedness, including, for example, for emergency response to different types of hazards. As I mentioned, this series will consist of three parts. During this first part today, we will get an overview of Sustainable Development Goal 11 and the new urban agenda. 
background and introduction to the main components of the Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements, and the role of Earth Observations in monitoring and informing cities and other types of human settlements, operations, and planning. Next week, for part two, on February 3rd, we will cover applications of the EO Toolkit to measure and analyze sustainable development goals, including the degree of urbanization tools and SDG 11 indicators, demonstration of the PopGrid website and viewer, and evaluation of the accuracy of gridded population data sets for SDG 11. 1.1 indicator on adequate housing, demonstration of pop grid for data set comparison for SDG 11.5.1 on people directly affected by disasters. And for our last part, three, on February 10th, we will go through a couple of use cases at the national and city level. So again, this is the outline for the presentation today. Overview of the role of Earth observations in monitoring, tracking, and implementing sustainable development goals. The Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals Initiative. Background and introduction to the main components of the Earth Observations Toolkit for sustainable cities and human settlements. And demonstration of the Earth Observations Toolkit for sustainable cities and human settlements. So now I would like to hand this off to our colleague, Dennis Mwaniki, Spatial Data Expert at the Data and Analytics Unit from the UN Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat. Dennis, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Aji, for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be participating in this uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Dennis Mwaniki. I work at uh, UN Habitat's Data and Analytics Unit, and I support the work on the integration of geospatial information and observation for urban monitoring. Uh, so at once, I'd like to welcome everyone and appreciate you uh, being able to attend the, this uh, series. My, my talk is going to be generally about the overview of the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the New Urban Agenda, and also show the linkages between these and how our observation and geospatial information uh, related data and resources are useful for the measurements, but also how these can be used to link to specific actions that uh, uh, are required to support the attainment of sustainability uh, in urban areas and cities uh, in particular. So welcome, and I'm going to jump off into uh, my slides. So I'm going to start with a, a quick introduction and overview of the, the Agenda 2030, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, and this is the, uh, like the shared vision for the, the world that we want. Uh, and it's, uh, it was discussed by member states and it was adopted in uh, 2015 in September. Uh, and it really uh, acts as the blueprint for uh, the world that we will we'll want to achieve by 2030. That would be a better world, a more sustainable world where we have peace and prosperity uh, for all uh, today, but also into the future. So this agenda replaced uh, the, the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, for those who don't know, the Millennium Development Goals were, uh, is what guided uh, the kind of uh, future uh, since 2000 through to 2015 and what was uh, the globally was being monitored uh, uh, during that, that period. So going back to the 2030 agenda, so the agenda itself has uh, five main areas of uh, work or at least interest uh, and these include people, uh, it really aims to make everyone uh, much more able to attain their personal goals, but also collective uh, goals of, of the different uh, people throughout the world. It aims to attain prosperity, it's a second component, but also looks at the aspect to do with the planet, uh, things like uh, ensuring uh, sustainability in land, in sea, ensuring that our environment is protected, issues of climate change and related. Uh, it also looks at peace, 
uh, without peace, of course, uh, not much in terms of prosperity can happen. So the agenda also looks at uh, aspects of peace and how that can be ensured to uh, work towards the attainment of sustainability. Then the, the fifth aspect that the agenda also focuses on is the aspect of partnership. And partnership is critical here because uh, not one person or not one city or not one country can achieve uh, all the goals without really working together internally, either with private sector, social, uh, civil society, uh, uh, government institutions and related, but also uh, countries and uh, regions also partnering and partner, partnering and um, collaborating on different programs and, and projects. So within these five main areas and uh, of the one agenda, the 2030 agenda, we have 17 goals. Uh, these 17 goals uh, uh, sort of define how we go towards attaining the future that we want. And this uh, range from um, issues to do with, uh, as I said, people uh, to planet, to aspects of peace, but also partnership. Uh, this goes just to uh, say in brief, we have a goal that focuses on uh, ending poverty. We have a goal focusing on uh, ending hunger, uh, a goal on uh, ensuring good health and well-being of all. Uh, quality education, uh, gender equality, clean water sanitation, uh, how, how affordable and clean energy work and economic growth, industry and innovation, reduce inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, which uh, during today's uh, discussion we'll be focusing on more. Uh, but we also have uh, goals on responsible uh, consumption and production, uh, climate change, life uh, below uh, water, but also life on land. Uh, peace, justice, and strong decisions, and finally partnerships uh, that will enable the attainment of all these goals. What is critical here is that uh, each of these goals is very important on its own, but the, all these goals also are connected to each other. Uh, so for example, uh, while we seek to end poverty, uh, we also seek to increase employment, so creation of work, uh, economic growth, uh, but we also seek to ensure that this is not just happening in uh, in one place, say in the cities and, uh, and urban areas, but this is also happening in the non-urban areas. So all these goals uh, really uh, speak to each other, uh, but each of the goals is also very, uh, very important on its own and it has specific actions uh, that are needed. So within each of the goals, we have what we call the targets, and the targets are the measurable aspects uh, that we would want to really attain and achieve uh, by the measuring measurement period up to 2030. And some of them, of course, will go beyond uh, beyond 2030. And we have 169 targets. So within each goal, we have about eight to 12 uh, targets. And these vary in terms of uh, the specifics of uh, what is required. And the targets are uh, categorized into two. Uh, we have targets which are specific to outcomes. So this, for example, could be to reduce the number of people that is living below the poverty line or to reduce the share population that is living in slums and informal settlements. But we also have other targets which are really related to the means of implementation and these are those which are about creating the enabling environment to make it possible to attain even the outcome related uh, uh, targets uh, such as for example uh, uh, creation of policies, say, that uh, ensure urban rural linkages or uh, policies that are specific to climate change and protection of, uh, of our environment. Then, so these are the targets, and for each of the targets, for it to be tracked how the progress is happening against each is where we have the indicators. And these indicators are just uh, a means to track each of the specific targets. So for each of the targets, we have about um, maybe one, two, three, four uh, indicators. And currently within the global framework, uh, we have 231 unique uh, indicators. Uh, these indicators, sometimes they, uh, they are replicating in different goals. And when you look at all the indicators plus those which are repeating in different targets, then we have about 200 and we have 247 uh, indicators. So yes, below just providing some links where you can learn more about the, uh, the goals, the SDG goals, but also where you can also access the list of indicators and targets uh, for you to explore further. So. Uh, uh, importantly, is uh, how to attain sustainability. Uh, and for this one, there are, as I mentioned before, there are different uh, components, there are different actions which are required at different levels. 
and uh, one of these most important uh, levels is the is the is the area of the of of urban areas and for the urban areas are critical to whether we attain sustainability by 2030 or not uh, why because uh, one urban areas are home today to majority of the world's population so if we are really going to attain sustainability across the five elements that i mentioned then we need to first focus on the uh, the people the environment uh, the physical environment uh, the water areas and, and related so the actions which are where the majority of the population live are very important because they will have high impact on the uh, the attainment of the goals but also on the kind of uh, ripple effect that uh, happens again i want to insist and repeat here that uh, it's not just about urban areas but the linkage between the different aspects of, of our world the urban the non-urban the rural this is critical but uh, yeah just emphasizing on, on the really importance of cities Another reason why cities are critical is that uh, they account for a lot of the energy consumption, but also greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the waste uh, generation uh, our world is uh, having today, uh, with about 75%, for example, of the energy consumed uh, in the world being consumed in cities and urban areas. And this is really significant because uh, the kind of um, footprint that this has is quite significant. So actions then have to be linked to, to this kind of uh, uh, focus in, in, in on cities and, and urban areas then then the, the other important component of course is that uh, as uh, traditionally we've had the cities grow as centers of uh, economy and they've been attracting a lot of people of course to go there looking for jobs so cities and urban areas are really uh, critical for the global uh, gdp and, and this is significant because of course as well as we had aim to attain wealth and prosperity aspects of economic growth are critical and cities play a really central role in this so the our former Sec deputy secretary general during during the the mayor's conference in 2015 was actually uh, is infamous uh, quote is that the battle for sustainable development would be lost won or lost in cities and this really holds true because uh, of some of the things that i have already mentioned but again I, I just want to reflect again that it's not just about cities but there's a lot of connect connections and links between cities and the non-urban areas uh, and the rural areas uh, that said <clears throat> Uh, I just want to give you a quick overview of the Sustainable Development Goal number 11, uh, which is about making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, uh, resilient, and sustainable. Uh, this, uh, as I said in my, as I showed in my first slide, this is just one of the 17 goals. Uh, that, but it is important because of uh, the reasons I've mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, the, the, this goal has uh, 10 targets. And these targets uh, are split into outcome and means of impl implementation targets. I, I, I say that the, the outcomes ones are those which like can be measured quantitatively or at least have uh, links that you can say uh, reduced by say 60% of the population living in slums. Just saying here hypothetically for, for explanation. Then the ones on means of implementation are the ones that are about really policies and, and creating an employing environment for uh, implementation of the of the goal uh, and, and the targets. So these targets, uh, the 10 targets in SDG 11 range from those on housing and slums, uh, sustainable transport, participatory planning, uh, cultural heritage, uh, ones on disaster reduction, air quality and waste management, uh, public spaces uh, for the outcome ones, and the issues on urban rural linkages and uh, associated to planning, uh, mitigation of climate change and resilience, and this is directly connected to the the Sendai framework uh, and the the ones for resilient buildings and cooperation and for each of these targets we have uh, one to two or three indicators uh, that are supposed to help you to measure uh, the progress against each target currently for target 11.c uh, the there is no indicator that is uh, uh, is available uh, because the, the the methodology is, is still uh, being considered. But currently, there is no indicator, and that is why we have three targets. Uh, three targets. Uh, 
I'm going to jump notes uh, slightly to say something about the new urban agenda, which is uh, an accelerator of the SDGs. And the new urban agenda was uh, ascended to in uh, 2016, right after the, the SDGs. It's actually the first uh, global uh, sort of uh, agreement after the Sustainable Development Goals. And what the new urban agenda focuses on is really uh, the interventions that are required to make cities and human settlements uh, 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 be more planned, uh, developed, and managed in sustainable ways uh, that is uh, linked to the, uh, the implementation of the 2030 agenda. So the new urban agenda is considered as an extension of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development in many ways because uh, even the measurements are really linked to the and related to the SDGs uh, and it also builds on the SDG. Uh, for this one, uh, some of the things that have happened in the, for example, within the SDG monitoring framework is that there are some of the things which are critical to measure, uh, or but are not necessarily captured within the SDG uh, indicator framework. So the new urban agenda is really expanded that so that uh, you, we get a much more comprehensive look of the urban uh, urban areas and uh, settlements, while we also keep in mind that the SDGs are really connected and uh, give us like the direction for the future we, we want to achieve. Uh, and the, the agenda has five uh, pillars. Uh, the first one is about national urban policies. Uh, it, the, the second one is about rules and regulations. The uh, third one is about urban planning and design. And the fourth is about financing urbanization. And the fifth is about uh, local implementation. Uh, if you look uh, clearly at this, you realize there are quite a bit of already linkages uh, between the, these five pillars and what is uh, shared, uh, available, at least what is provided within the, the SDG, particularly SDG 11. For example, uh, the target uh, 11 point A is about uh, national urban policies uh, in, in the SDGs. It, they, they is, the, is about the, uh, creating the linkages between the urban and rural areas and uh, things to do with the partnerships and corporations all this and, and financing all these are really part of already borrowed from the SDG framework uh, and uh, here just being re-emphasized as a way in which we uh, can implement them so that we achieve a much more sustainable and uh, functional uh, cities and urban areas. Uh, so generally, uh, just as, as a conclusion, the SDG, the, the, rather, sorry, the, the new urban agenda provides a spatial framework uh, for the delivery of the SDGs, uh, particularly within the uh, urban areas and focuses on local level implementation. This is critical because uh, we might measure, we might have targets and uh, goals on what we want to achieve, but it's important to link this really to specific uh, action areas where this would be really implemented. Uh, within the, the new urban agenda, like the SDGs, there's also a monitoring framework uh, that guides how we track progress, again, towards the attainment of the new urban agenda. Uh, and for this one, we have two main work areas. We have what we call the transformative commitments, uh, but we also have the effective in implementation uh, components. Uh, and within this, we have what we call categories and subcategories. So the categories, for example, for transformative commitments uh, have uh, range from things like social inclusion and ending poverty. If you look at this keenly again, you realize this is linking already to goal one, it's about uh, ending poverty. Uh, we have uh, things to do with sustainable and inclusive urban prosperity. You remember the five uh, aspects I mentioned uh, for the SDGs is uh, people, prosperity, planet, uh, and, 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 and things to do with partnership. So this, you can, you can clearly see that uh, the second item here and the transformative commitment is really linking again to the prosperity aspects uh, that are priority for the sustainable development goals. Uh, of course, we have uh, things to do with the environmental sustainability and resilience. These are linked again to the SDGs, but also other uh, frameworks such as the, the Sendai framework, uh, but also the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Then uh, for the effective implementation, we have things uh, again to do with the govern uh, creating governance structures, uh, ensuring planning and management of urban spatial development, as well as the means of implementation. And, and the subcategories for this really are it's like going down from the goal to uh, the targets and to the indicators. 
and this again like the SDGs what what happens with the SDGs is you use the indicator to track progress towards the targets then the targets towards the goal so the same structure is really uh, applied here I'm not going to go into the details of the subcategories but just to show you there there is another tier of uh, uh, measurements that from the subcategories then go to the specific indicators the and the, the what I want to say about the indicators here is that for the new urban agenda is that uh, these are connected to the uh, a lot of them are connected to the SDGs. So you have like all the SDG 11 indicator for, indicators, for example, are part of the uh, new urban agenda monitoring framework, uh, and maybe a few extra ones which uh, are places where they are they have been identified by experts and uh, during different group meetings as uh, having gaps uh, in in the measurement of progress at the local level for. Uh, and also tracking the, uh, the attainments and achievements uh, towards sustainability. So currently we have about 77 indicators and as I mentioned these are mostly drawn from the SDGs uh, with just a few additions uh, which are also drawn from other uh, existing frameworks such as uh, Sendai framework and Paris agreement uh, and, and as well as regional ones uh, like say uh, regional development agendas for Europe, for Africa uh, and for other regions. Okay, now uh, enough of the background. Now uh, I want to dive in a bit into the the ad observation uh, toolkit uh, background and says, talk a bit about why it is important and how ad observation and your spatial information uh, really contributing to the SDG 11 monitoring, uh, but also the new urban agenda uh, as a way of extension. Uh, just looking at the SDG 11, uh, we we have specific requirements within uh, this uh, goal that uh, needs us to apply our observation and just partial information uh, kind of techniques uh, and data to do different things. Uh, the first important thing is that uh, if you look at an area, uh, it, there can be significant variations in uh, what the value that you attain is depending on which unit of analysis you're looking at. Um, I'll, here I'll, I'll give an example. If you look at a city, for example, as, uh, as a metropolitan area, and you measure uh, how the share of population with access to transport, for example, or the provision of transport infrastructure, you will have variations between, say, the old city or the, the tiny part of the city that perhaps is the old city that was always functional traditionally, uh, which would, might be varied with the newly emerging areas. So that if you decide then to scale down from the metropolitan area and only focus on the old city, then you are likely to have completely different measurements for this uh, for this indicator. And so here, what we've analyzed and uh, this uh, came up with was that depending on how you define your city or what you define as a city or urban areas in your context, then you are likely to have uh, different measurements and these measurements would have be problematic comparing them between say one city or one urban area and another even within the same country and this when it grows even crosses to different countries then becomes even much more problematic and for this one we working with different partners uh, is, is why we uh, work towards harmonization on how we define cities and urban areas and from that we uh, the agreement has been that uh, uh, we use the degree urbanization. I know the, the second part of this webinar, Thomas Kemper is going to discuss about the degree urbanization and how it's applied, uh, just in saying that it's important how we define cities and urban areas uh, be consistent. And this is an area where uh, use of geospatial data and ad observation plays a very critical role. The second useful in SDG 11 is that there are indicators which cannot be computed without using uh, uh, Ad observation data and geospatial analysis techniques. And these ones, uh, these particular ones include the indicator 11.2.1 on the access, the provision and access to public transport in cities and urban areas. The second 11.3.1 is on the the, uh, the rate of change of uh, cities in terms of how they grow spatially versus how their population changes. And the third one is 11.7.1 on the provision and access to open public spaces in cities. So these indicators, you cannot measure them without really uh, doing undertaking spatial data analysis of, of sorts, or at least integrating some bit of observation, of observation data. The third uh, thing I want to mention is, yeah, is that uh, 
you beyond the three indicators which require direct uh, use of uh, this uh, sort of data and uh, technologies there are also some indicators which can be estimated uh, using your spatial data and for example indicator 11.1.1 here is about the shell population that uh, that lives in slums and informal settlements uh, uh, and this can be estimated really by looking at the morphology of the settlements and estimating, uh, uh, getting like a, an estimate of what the shell population within a city is likely to be living uh, in slums and informal settlements. And this this really creates an interesting shift from what we've been doing traditionally, which has been to use uh, what we call deprivations, uh, say deprivation for basic things like water, sanitation, aspects to do with the security of tenure and related. And again, this even also adds the value of starting to understand where these informal settlements in different cities and countries are really located that can then shape specific action. The same can be done for 11.5.1. This is about the, the, the population who are affected by these uh, disasters. So if you have, say, uh, disaggregated population data and uh, different settlement models, you can actually be able to even uh, predict the risk of, of populations. And once disaster strikes, you can estimate uh, very quickly uh, what your population is likely to have been affected uh, during that, uh, that disaster. So in a nutshell, uh, within SDG 11, we use then uh, uh, ad observation and geospatial information to do three or four main things. One, as I said, to identify uh, urban areas from non-urban areas. I talk slightly about this in the next slide. Uh, extracting indicator-specific information and data. Uh, disaggregating population data. This is critical uh, for measurement of the different access components of uh, uh, facilities such as public transport, open spaces, uh, uh, which are part of indicator 11.2.1 and 11.7.1. Uh, and another important one is just visualizing the data and showing what uh, kind of uh, trends are happening. This is very critical even for policymakers and decision making to show where, or which kind of interventions are required in which uh, parts of the city. Okay, now um, uh, here I'm going to give you an example for, of indicator 11.3.1. I just show you only three applications on how we use uh, ad observation and geospatial information for computation of this indicator. Uh, and indicator 11.3.1 is about the ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate. And what this indicator looks, looks at is really uh, how are cities and urban areas growing uh, in space but also how their population is changing. And from this we get, uh, we attain a ratio that can help us to know whether the city is, extend, is expanding or identifying faster than the population is growing. And that has very specific uh, uh, implication in the terms of the policies and actions which are needed for that uh, specific uh, city. So the first use uh, for this indicator for of use of ad observation and geospatial information for indicator 1131 is to identify the urban area uh, that uh, I mentioned before. This indicator is very important to use a harmonized definition because uh, depending on how you look and where you look within an area, you are likely to uh, under measure or over measure. So if, for example, you look only at the, the core city in many places, uh, in many countries, a lot of growth of urban areas now is happening outside the official uh, boundaries. I'm just putting official here in quotation mark. Uh, and that if you only focus on that official boundary, then you are likely really not to understand or capture the real magnitude of growth happening uh, in this uh, in this area. So with colleagues from uh, the World Bank, uh, European Commission, FAO, and uh, uh, ILO, and others, we we worked on this uh, agreement that was approved in March to 2020, that member states agreed to uh, use the degree of urbanization as a harmonized global definition for cities and urban areas only for statistical purposes. Here, I want to emphasize that the intention for this is not to change how countries define their cities, but really to be able to produce data that is consistent and that, that can be uh, replicated and compared uh, across uh, across countries and cities and, and for this application then for and observation and geospatial information for this uh, identification of urban areas it's uh, the method itself is heavy on the use of uh, things like built up area uh, population data from the, at the highest ratio from the national statistics offices and this approach helps you to disaggregate this population from say uh, 
enumeration areas which would be varying in size to equal size grid. Then from that you apply uh, an approach uh, that uh, looks at the population density as well as the total population of uh, adjoining grids to to decide whether an area or a given grid is an urban grid or is a suburban or is a rural grid. And here uh, it's very critical that uh, this uh, geospatial information and other observation related products are, are utilized. Then from once you identify then the, the grids which are urban rural, then you can apply that to the administrative uh, units uh, at the, the local level. And that can help you make a decision whether given say, uh, enumeration area or small administrative unit is urban or rural. Uh, Thomas Kemper is going to really explain much further on this and that's, uh, we look forward to, to you participating in the three sessions so that you also see how this uh, gets applied. The second application of uh, these technologies and resources is the, the extraction of built up areas. Uh, I mentioned that indicator 1131 really looks at where growth is happening and for this one you need to identify uh, the, the built up areas or the areas which are newly built up or built up between a given time and another time. And you can do this depending on the input data that you're using at uh, whatever resolution. If you have very, very high resolution, say satellite imagery, you can do this from maybe severe uh, measurements. But if you're using maybe open source uh, imagery, sentinels, Landsat, perhaps you can use much uh, five, 10 year intervals to, to track this. So these are not the second very important component uh, for measuring this indicator. Uh, and the third one is uh, important that uh, since uh, you remember I mentioned that the, the approach we're using for defining cities, uh, the degree urbanization is not necessarily based on the administrative definition. So we need to disaggregate population uh, from the different uh, sized uh, enumeration area, census tracts, or administrative units to more equal size grids, uh, which can then help us to to uh, be able to estimate the population component of this. Because the unit that we use to estimate the, the built up uh, area change is the same unit that we should use to uh, also estimate the change in the population uh, data or the trends uh, for the specific unit. So here, population, the disaggregation happens in different ways. You can disaggregate from, say, uh, census data as blocks, but you can also aggregate it from household data from that is highly available from the national uh, statistical offices and the censuses to create the grids which are very critical. Okay, so why did we uh, really work so hard to create the Earth Observation Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlement? From what I've showed, you, you realize that uh, there is really a high increase in the need, need and the demand for Earth Observation and Geospatial Information data to support SDG level monitoring. And I did not talk about even the new urban agenda. The new urban agenda even has much more uh, additional requirements for measurement uh, using this uh, kind of technologies. So what we've realized working this uh, past years is that uh, we have a lot of resources which are available at the local country level, at the city levels, at the global level, at the regional levels, but these are scattered, uh, have been scattered for so in so many different places, uh, which, uh, has made it very difficult for one for someone to go and understand from one from one place what resources are available. So this was one reason why it was important for us to really try and to create a way of bringing all these resources together. The second thing is even with, with these resources existing, each has a different kind of strength. And these strengths can really vary depending on the spatial resolution, but also the, 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 the scale of application. So some of them are, as I said, local, others are national, others are regional, others are global. So depending on the, this, uh, the, the, the demand or the need some, someone has, uh, these uh, resources then would make it, uh, uh, putting them in the same place would make it possible for someone to assess what resources are available, but also how accurate or how good they would be to resolve a, a specific need. So for example, if you're looking at uh, expansion of cities, would be perhaps use a different data set to when you're looking at the provision and availability of things like public transport stops or open spaces in cities, as well as the population who can access them. So again, it's important and within the toolkit, we have a, a means to verify uh, the kind of data that comes in and also look for the suitability of these data sets to uh, fit different, uh, different needs. The, the third and uh, last item here, just uh, not meaning that all I'm exhausting them, uh, but there is 
an important thing we've learned about from uh, undertaking capacity building activities across cities and countries is that in many cases we always get asked uh, where has this been applied and this is important to show case, case studies of where uh, different technologies have been put or what uh, other countries or other cities are doing and show the successes of this uh, application of these uh, resources and technology. So again, the toolkit really uh, brings this uh, into life, showing what other, uh, other people have done or what other countries have done and how it has worked for them and some of the challenges they faced and how they overcame. And this really is a significant uh, addition because it helps even new countries that they apply this to really reduce the kind of uh, effort or the, the mistakes that are, they're likely to make, as well as also sharing some of the available tools and resources. So uh, based on that, the, the need and all the things, then uh, working within uh, the, the, uh, the, the steering committee of the toolkit, which is a collaboration between different partners, uh, the, the question we always ask ourselves is what would be the best things to present in the toolkit? And uh, as a start, what we saw it would be most valuable uh, uh, four uh, things. The first one was the aspect and uh, things to do with data. So this really documenting all the data that is available at different resolution, giving it a metadata to explain what the data is about, what it does, what it can be used for, and so on and so forth. The second one was uh, also documenting the tools that are available and put it them in the same place so that people can easily access them and uh, try them. Um, the, the third one, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is about showcasing the use cases, how different uh, countries and cities are utilizing really these technologies and uh, presenting them in a uniform way so that someone can see, for example, the experiences of Colombia vis-a-vis -vis the experiences of Greece or the experiences of South Africa and try to to really see how where they fit in in terms of their technological capacity ability and, and which then path they is best they are best suited to follow. So then the third, the fourth uh, element is also the learning opportunities like this one we're having today uh, about uh, really making the knowledge uh, go out there about what is available, uh, but also uh, creating like opportunities to show people how these uh, uh, technologies and resources can be used to, to facilitate the measurement of the SDG level. Uh, so the toolkit really brings uh, together all these things, but it also importantly brings together a lot of partners uh, who are working on all these things. The partners working on the data, the tools, even the countries working on the use cases and uh, all these people providing a learning opportunity. This was very critical because for a long time, uh, since we started work on the, the SDGs and the monitoring and the uh, support to countries, we realized that we had a lot of data producers and uh, users, but uh, there was a bit of divergence in terms of the methodological aspects. Uh, different organizations would measure the same indicator differently, and that was creating a bit of problem because uh, you'd have, say, your habitat reporting on uh, data in a certain way, then other organizations report on that in another way. Uh, and this, uh, through the toolkit, we've actually been able to bring all these people together, and we discuss as, uh, as a community some of the actions, some of the interventions, and use them that to shape uh, uh, what kind of future we want. Even the gaps that are being identified by the users in the countries and cities, we are able to really bring our heads together and uh, try to resolve, uh, to resolve those uh, collectively. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, the management here for the toolkit is not uh, it's not just about one person. It really includes participation from UN Habitat, uh, GEO, EO for SDG, city representatives, uh, representatives from academia, representatives from countries, uh, and so on and so forth. Even interested parties who come and uh, give opinions and and uh, and also their inputs to the to the work that we do. So with that. Uh, I want to, to thank you uh, for listening and uh, welcome back Aji who is going to now talk a bit more about the toolkit but also the work of uh, your for SDG. Uh, thank you and looking forward to your participation in all, this, uh, all the parts of the, this webinar.
yeah so with that uh, i'm going to pass over back to aji who is going to talk uh, more in detail about the toolkit uh, also give us a tour of the toolkit and what we have uh, but also talk uh, a bit about the work of the eofs the eofs dg that is supporting this uh, as well as some of the the data and other observation related products that uh, are available and can be leveraged for for the work uh, supporting the toolkit in future Thank you very much, Dennis. So now before diving more into the toolkit and giving you a tour of this online knowledge resource, I'd like to share a bit about some efforts to understand and capture how Earth observations from space-borne, airborne, and in situ platforms provide valuable information that is useful to produce sustainable development goal indicators and inform the relevant targets and goals. Earth observations can complement national statistics at the appropriate scale for SDG reporting and are a crucial data source for many of the indicators describing the environmental aspects of our planet and for indicator disaggregation at finer special scales. The Group on Earth Observations and participating organizations and contributors such as the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites have analyzed and mapped the relevance of Earth observations for targets and indicators, as well as the potential technical improvements afforded by Earth observations in the indicator methodologies, in addition to the benefits of Earth observations for supporting the indicator framework in the long term. Past assessments include a booklet produced by GEO in 2017 featuring case studies showcasing Earth observations for specific indicators, as well as an EO handbook produced by CEOs that demonstrated that 73 targets and 29 indicators in total can be supported by Earth observations. These reports have also demonstrated the importance of Earth observations for SDG 6 on clean water and sanitation, 11 on sustainable cities and communities, 14 life below water and 15 life on land in particular, as their respective targets and indicators require information on land cover, land productivity, above ground biomass, water extent or quality characteristics, as well as air quality and pollution that can be informed by Earth observations. These and additional assessments can be found at the EO4STG website, eo4stg.org. So what is EO4STG? It is an international initiative from the Group on Earth Observations that aims to extend the use of Earth observations and derived knowledge to advance the 2030 Agenda on sustainable development and enable societal benefits through the achievement of the SDGs. It is co-chaired by the United States, Japan and Mexico, and its main goals include demonstrating practical uses of Earth observations and derived knowledge, building capacity, promoting open data access and open knowledge, and supporting country and stakeholder adoption of Earth observations for SDG implementation, monitoring, and reporting. And so you can see here a screenshot of the website where you can find out more information on featured projects, upcoming events, related news, and other relevant material. So I invite you to visit the website. So here you see some examples of SDG 11 related Earth observation data and products. Cities and human settlements in all their diverse forms appropriate land in different ways. Surface reflectance data products are useful for measuring urbanization and land consumption. An example of such a data product is the harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 data set, which takes input data from the NASA and USGS Landsat 8 and the European Space Agency Sentinel-2A and 2B satellites to generate a harmonized analysis-ready surface reflectance data product. Synthetic aperture radar imagery 
and data products are also useful and provide a unique perspective for monitoring urbanization. SAR instruments are able to penetrate cloud cover and pollution and work in both day and night conditions. Land cover data sets are also very important for SDG 11 monitoring. Land cover can be defined as the observable biophysical material at the Earth's surface. Land cover maps describe this spatially using a number of classes, which represent different surfaces such as forests and lakes. Some maps cover a number of different thematic classes and others focus on specific classes such as forests, water bodies, and urban built-up areas. Many countries have systems in place that regularly produce such land cover mapping products. In cases, however, where there is little or no capacity to regularly produce an appropriate national land cover data set, regional or global EO land cover maps can be most valuable. Vegetation indices measure the amount of green vegetation over a given area and can be used to assess vegetation health. This is important, especially in urban environments, as tracking the extent and condition of green spaces can help with planning efforts to advance well-being, bring down city temperatures, and improve air quality. A combination of ground and satellite-based data sets provides a unique view of the globe to better understand the movement and impact of air pollution events, including in cities and other human settlements, and can also help infer the risk for health conditions or diseases that are exacerbated by poor air quality. Presently, the toolkit provides data on mean levels of fine particulate matter in cities, alongside several data sets responding to the population of cities necessary to calculate SDG 11 related indicators. At night, satellite images of Earth capture a uniquely human signal, artificial lighting. Remotely sensed lights at night provide a data source for improving our understanding of where human settlements are located and associated energy infrastructures, as well as disaster impacts and recovery. Earth observation data and imagery also indirectly support the generation of disaggregated maps of global, regional, or national population data, complementing census data and filling in data gaps. Gridded population data sets provide key inputs for a range of indicators that measure change in urban-related characteristics with respect to population growth or other demographic-related parameters. So the Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements represents this ongoing effort to bring together urban-related Earth Observation data and tools and put this into context for analysts and decision makers at local community level, as well as at city and national level. It is a collaborative effort between the GEO EO for SDG initiative, UN Habitat, and over 40 organizations from government, academia, research institutions, non-governmental organizations, space agencies, and the private sector. The web portal hosts use cases, data, and tools for SDG 11 applications on housing, open spaces, urbanization, and public transport. Example data sets include the global human settlement built-up presence derived from Landsat's image collection, as well as the global human settlement built-up information layer derived from Sentinel-2, which maps the probability that a pixel is built up and can be used to analyze urbanization, map population, or analyze exposure to natural hazards. The toolkit resources can be filtered by different parameters, such as topics of interest, data characteristics, data source, coding environment, and SDG indicator to help users discern application areas and distinct attributes for the data and tools. Here you see the list of the Earth Observation Processing tools currently available as part of this resource. An example of an online tool that is part of the EO Toolkit is the NASA 
socioeconomic data application center upgrade viewer, which enables the evaluation of key differences in gridded population products. To identify strengths and weaknesses for using gridded population data sets in monitoring urban related parameters, it is important that Earth observation experts work together with city and country level end users to compare different gridded population counts with field referenced data and assess their applicability and accuracy in addressing local to national monitoring needs. In addition to the data and tools, there are a number of country and city level use cases that illustrate how local or national governments and research networks have applied Earth observation data and knowledge to fill monitoring gaps and address reporting needs or guide policy actions. For example, the humanitarian open street map team has been working with local organizations in Indonesia to use satellite imagery combined with artificial intelligence assisted mapping activities to map all road networks. This information is crucial for supporting the government and local responders to reach all people as quickly as possible when disasters hit. Colombia's National Administrative Department of Statistics, DANE, has been successful at showcasing the value of statistical and earth observation data integration to produce SDG 11 indicators. And you will hear more about their work at part three of our uh, webinar series. They have, for example, leveraged census data as well as Landsat and Sentinel-2 satellite images to help calculate indicator 11.3.1 the ratio of land consumption to population growth rate for 63 Colombian cities for the 2015 to 2020 time period. And based on this experience, they then developed a methodology to also calculate indicator 11.7.1 on open spaces for public use for a sample of cities in 2021. Again, you will hear more about some of these use cases at part three of our webinar series. Next, we will go ahead and, and present a short demonstration of the EU toolkit. As already highlighted, the Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements provides relevant Earth Observation data, tools, and use cases grouped by thematic area. And so we have four thematic categories, adequate housing, open spaces, sustainable urbanization, and public transport. And users can access relevant data and filter this information by year, indicators, format, resolution, the data source and type, different types of keywords such as hazards, impervious surface, population, as well as the level of the data set. So for instance, if we're interested in global data sets, and we would like to identify the ones that are of relevance for indicator 11.1.1. We can see here the global data sets that provide context information to address indicator 11.1 on slums and informal settlements or adequate housing. And so here, for instance, you see some of those data sets, such as the global human settlement built up presence and the global human settlement population data sets that can help visualize built up and population dynamics and provide also temporal information when overlaid with local slum boundaries. Another key data set that you can see is the VIRS plus DMSP change in lights. And so these data sets can provide a socioeconomic proxy and allow for the visualization of built up areas with missing street lights that often highly correlate with slum locations. And so 
In a similar manner, we can look at the tools section of the toolkit and identify different uh, types of tools that can be used to visualize and help calculate specific indicators. So for instance, when looking at indicator 11.3.1 for urbanization, we see a number of tools that are available and we can access the tool itself and also relevant information such as documentation, tutorials, and webinars where available. So in addition, you can access uh, different use cases from cities and countries that are leveraging Earth observation data and tools to monitor and report on SDG 11 related indicators by hovering over and clicking on the map uh, here. So for example, here you can see three different use cases from Colombia um, that are available. And you can also look at the uh, different use case profiles below the map and access those. So for instance, if we look at one of these use cases, you can find out relevant information, including a video recording that describes the use case, relevant resources in the form of data sets, reports, and other material of relevance that is available, openly available. Uh, in addition, you can look at relevant indicators that this use case is addressing, the partners and contributors to the use case, and there is also uh, a list of points of contact along with uh, their email so that you can reach out to them. In addition, as part of the use case description, you can find information on the relevant Earth observation data sets that are being applied, the workflow, including specific steps, as well as results, impact, enabling factors, as well as constraints and conclusions for each use case. In addition to the data, tools, and use cases, there are other resources that users can access, including guidance documents, as well as trainings. And so these are other additional levels of information available to you to help you better understand how you can leverage the information in the toolkit to visualize and assess available data and more quickly access this data of interest to compute relevant indicators and address specific needs. So except for webinars, you can also find information on specific user guides. Lastly, you can get involved with the toolkit and you can find out more about the um, people that are currently contributing and are involved as part of this resource. And so this, we just launched this part of the page. And so this is a work in progress. There are many more colleagues that will be getting added to um, uh, this page. And so you can read more about how they are using or contributing to the toolkit. And um, we invite you to also submit information yourself if you do, um, if you are able to use this resource and leverage it to address specific uh, uh, needs um, that you may have. We would like to hear from you about how you're finding this resource useful. And we also want to hear from you if you have relevant um, use cases or information to contribute, or if you have other feedback that you can uh, provide us with in terms of making this uh, resource more useful and applicable uh, to you and your needs, your organization's needs. And so here you can see how you can take a survey about um, how you are contributing or leveraging the toolkit resources, and you can also provide additional information through this longer contribution form. Uh, you can find out more information and, and uh, under contact us and also under about about the toolkit. And so here there is another form that where you can provide feedback or comments about the toolkit and you can share your specific area or areas of interest and provide additional feedback and comments. And so with that, we will end our quick demonstration of um, the EO toolkit and go back to our slide deck. 
And so these are some of the references and resources that were used for this presentation. So I invite you to take some time and, and uh, read through this material. And as a reminder, here is the contact information for myself and Dennis. You can find all the information about the training, including links to download the materials from the training website shown here. And do please check out the many other trainings we have available on the RSET website listed here. We encourage you to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events, as well as SDG and EO for SDG related activities. So next week on February 3rd for part two, we will cover applications of the EO toolkit to measure and analyze sustainable development goals including the degree of urbanization tools and SDG 11 indicators, demonstration of off-grid website and viewer, evaluating the accuracy of gridded population data sets for SDG 11.1.1 on adequate housing, and demonstration of the pop grid website and viewer for data set comparison for SDG 11.5.1 on people directly affected by disasters. Thank you very much. And we will now move to our Q&A session. Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, having listened to our presentations. And thank you also for sharing some first questions. And so we will start uh, from the top and look at each question. and. We've uh, started a working document that will be shared at the um, end of uh, the training uh, with you. And so we will try to get to all the questions today. I think we should be able to do that. But if there are any additional questions that we may not get to today, we'll make sure that we respond to those in a written manner and this will be provided to you after the training. And so we'll start with uh, question one, are future trainings about other SDGs planned? And so as you see from the response there, yes, uh, uh, NASA's supply remote sensing training program continues to develop training centered on SDGs. And there is a link there where you can find out more SDG related trainings. I also want to point you to the EO for SDG website where you can access a range of resources, including some uh, um, handbooks and guides of relevance to how Earth observations can be applied to sustainable development goal targets and indicators in addition to use cases from countries and cities around the world, and also some ongoing projects between um, earth uh, um, science providers and practitioners and uh, city planners or others representing a national or local government. Um, let's uh, go to uh, question two. And so how can we execute developmental projects for our urban cities without affecting homeowners' means or livelihoods? Perhaps I'll, I'll see if Dennis wants to respond to this question and elaborate. And I don't hear Dennis. So as you can see, we have uh, already provided a response here. So the toolkit provides a list of different types of resources that can help contribute to development indicators and related projects. And understanding different urban components is key to protecting people and their means of livelihoods. For example, one main impact of urban growth is conversion of fertile agricultural land or even encroachment into fragile environments. And so there are data sets and also EU data processing tools uh, um, and also data visualization tools that can help provide input um, in, in that regard. We also wanted to highlight that there are different tools in the toolkit where, that can help, again, for instance, be used to estimate indicators around built up areas and then compare that with population growth, for example. But we do want to note that we are working with three 
and open data and that the, the resolution of that data may not be sufficient in some cases when applied to very detailed local analysis. So you may require very high resolution data that sometimes is not openly and freely available. And we that we will go to question three. And we calculate STG 11 for a specific part of an urban area. For example, if we are interested to know how sustainable a university campus is, is this toolkit still useful? And so we have provided a response there. I will pause to see if Thomas, one of our colleagues and trainers, would like to take this on. Yes, uh, thank you, RG. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Good, uh, thank you. So yeah, this is, this is related uh, again to what you already mentioned earlier. Um, theoretically, it is possible uh, to calculate also the SDG indicators for very local uh, situations, uh, like the example you provided there, the, the university campus. But this requires, of course, uh, the necessary data. And that in that uh, case also needs to be very high resolution data. So you have to be able to really identify uh, the outline of a single building and uh, have to understand how many people are living there. So such data are usually not integrated in the uh, EO for SCG toolkit because it's uh, not free, but uh, the satellite imagery you have to buy commercially and uh, the uh, information on the population um, at that level of detail is also becoming sensitive. So you may require uh, with your, your city or with the National Statistical Office if, if information can be shared, but at a certain point uh, for privacy reasons, they will not do so. So there's, there are some limitations, but uh, um, that depends on a case by case. And again, it is mostly not free and open data and as such, not so much covered uh, by the Earth Observation Toolkit. Wonderful, thank you, Thomas. We will then move to question four. How is urban livability related to SDG 11? And if we wanted to work with in a developing country specific state, which is developing in nature, then what indicators represent the best research outcome that will be implemented at the central level? So here we've discussed uh, what uh, what are some key components of urban liability and so that are already within the STG 11 indicator framework. For instance, this relates to housing, adequate housing, the lack of congestion, access to public services, the quality of the environment, proximity to public spaces that enhance urban liability, uh, and also promote the good health of population, among others, and, and also support the reduction of inequalities and promote equitable development. And so a lot of the data sets and tools in the toolkit do provide uh, information and can serve as strong, strong socioeconomic proxies toward many of these areas that I've uh, uh, discussed here and as shown earlier, the, the resources in the toolkit are actually grouped under four main thematic areas and can also be filtered by additional um, areas of thematic relevance. Uh, so, for instance, looking at uh, urban air quality um, or looking at aspects of access to adequate housing. And so you see here that, for instance, the toolkit provides data on mean levels of fine particular matter in cities, and that can be used alongside several data sets related to population of cities to help um, compute uh, relevant um, STG 11 indicators. We will move now to question five. Or yes, that's right. So I am very interested in knowing what problems the developing and underdeveloped countries face and how they are dealing with these challenges. Please, if possible, give us some specific examples. Um, 
And so I think that uh, one of the first things I would say is that you can take a look at the use cases that we already have in the toolkit that include a range of examples from both developed and developing countries and cities. And so you will see, for instance, some use cases where they leverage geospatial and, and Earth observation, such as satellite imagery and other data sets to help map and inform um, the um, mapping of road uh, networks. Uh, so we have, for example, a, a use case in Indonesia. And so that can help then better prepare and address uh, responses to different types of disasters if we understand where roads are. And then also through some of the data, the population data sets, we can also help infer where people are and what's the access of people to, um, to roads. Uh, and so this is just one example, but there are several other examples around understanding um, how informal settlements develop and what are the different conditions and again access to basic services or basic infrastructure for people living in such areas is another um, good example that comes to mind and that uh, resources in the toolkit can help serve as proxies to address some of these uh, uh, elements. And let me pause there and see if one of my any of my panelists want to also add input to this question. Hello. Hi, Ed. Yes, please, Dennis. Go ahead. Okay, 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 perfect. Uh, sorry, I had the problem unmuting. Yeah, so for the for, for me, my intervention on this one would be a lot of uh, developing and underdeveloped countries face uh, a, a mix of challenges and here i'm just referring i'm not sure whether the question was uh, specific to in terms of the other observation just special information related but uh, only focusing on this area they, they face challenges of really a lot of requirements to measure uh, also or to monitor at the global level different things but they also have specific requirements at the local level to understand the urban systems and here uh, specifically in terms of uh, uh, earth observation geospatial information one of the main things we've seen uh, from you and Abit that working with the, some of these countries is that uh, one is that they lack uh, or at least they lack adequate uh, technology in terms of uh, core infrastructure some some of the some of the resources and work requires a bit of advancements in terms of the infrastructure to process uh, like if they are doing this at the national level then they need a bit of high processing power uh, which is usually not very readily available in most of these countries but they also lack uh, a lot of people who have the required experience parties and skills to do this in, in a scalable way. Uh, there's a lot of work on going to continuously build the capacities and have on the job training uh, with, with, with these countries, but this still continues to be to be a major issue. And here is also where uh, the toolkit really comes in, in handy because it's able to provide them at least a starting point uh, for, for, for some of the key things like just understanding the distribution of built up areas in their country or even uh, with which part of their cities are growing um, or, and new developments are coming up. And this really plays a, a significant role, not just in making them have access to some data, but even uh, showing to the policymakers and the people who are responsible for some of these actions the value that uh, some of these technologies can have uh, and which then can translate to really investments uh, in, in the right uh, resources or infrastructure to do this uh, kind of work. Great, thank you very much, Dennis. On question number six, will NASA or FSTG be able to provide any technical assistance and or consulting on scoping a project for our city? So I do want to first clarify that eo for stg is an international global uh, initiative on Earth observations for sustainable development goals. NASA is part of this initiative and currently serves as one of the co-chairs on behalf of the US. But again, this is a global initiative that comprises of a number of contributors from space agencies to academia and research organizations to um, practitioners and users of Earth observations from local and, and 
national governments as well as private sector entities among others um, so we do have so eu for sdg focuses on earth observations for sustainable development goals uh, and then within or as part of the initiative we're collaborating with other global initiatives and organizations on the eo toolkit that was presented here today and so as part of that specific effort we have engaged in and part of the as part of this effort a number of cities and country uh, governments uh, national government level organizations contribute and provide um, feedback on how earth observation data and tools of relevance to um, urban uh, city level uh, development um, can be further improved and applied to local needs. And so we invite you to um, to write to us to contact us and if you'd like to be part of this initiative um we would love to to make you part of this um we do have as mentioned a committee that is part of this toolkit effort that comprises of both earth uh, science and new data providers practitioners as well as uh, um, uh, city governments and other users uh, of uh, earth science information and so certainly within that frame there is exchange and, and and feedback provided and so we invite you again to be part of that uh we'll go to question seven are the indicators 11 a b and c contributed by earth observations and geospatial information is there direct or indirect use of earth observations on those indicators and so uh, I will definitely, I, I need, so indicators 11A, B and C, so I know that 11A is on the urban rural links and planning and 11B is on mitigation of climate change and resilience. I do need a, a reminder myself on 11C, so Dennis, maybe you can help me in that. I think that, uh, um, I will note that uh, yes, certainly there are contributions and Earth observations can directly or indirectly as proxies help inform um, parts of these uh, uh, targets. Uh, but let me let me invite Dennis and perhaps Thomas as well to offer some thoughts here. Sure, sure, Aji, and, and thanks. I think it's an interesting question. So the, these indicators are, are indirectly contributed. They don't have direct contribution from uh, uh, geo, uh, geospatial information per se, because like 11A is about the national urban policies and the urban rural continuum linkages, where, where this geospatial really plays a key role here is uh, on the identification of these uh, areas, urban and uh, non-suburban areas to the rural links, which is critical. I mentioned already in this, the presentation about the importance of the definitions, uh, which really rely heavily on geospatial. But these three indicators are really uh, heavy on uh, policy aspects, but the, what feeds the information for the uh, development of the policies is also solid uh, uh, information that is EO or geospatial heavy. Great, thank you, Dennis. We'll go to the next uh, question then. Have you considered incorporating data from open source air quality sensors? OpenAQ is a potent data source of local air measurements. Thank you for that uh, question. Uh, I will note that there are some data sets of relevance to air quality and indicator 11.6.2 that looks at population weighted um, concentrations of particulate matter and so if you look at uh, uh, the data section you will find uh, some of those data sets um, uh, that uh, are included in the toolkit this is still work in progress as um, we would like to potentially further um, improve on the resources that we have in that domain in the toolkit. Uh, but uh, you can look at what we currently have available by going under data, 
indicators and, and selecting air quality, the air quality one. Uh, Dennis or Thomas, any, any more thoughts from you on this question? Okay, Are, we will go to the next question then. Are the methodologies available and can they be adapted to suit the peculiarities of specific locations? Uh, most methods, so yes, so we have a range of, uh, so for the different data and tools included in the toolkit, the methods, including the, the peer-reviewed publication, metadata, as well as additional guidance uh, documents were available in addition to, to, to uh, webinars and tutorials are provided. And so in most cases, this can be used and hence be adapted to local conditions. Um, moreover, there are a number of tools that can be used also with local data and provide the ability, for instance, for a user to combine some of the global EO data sets with uh, uh, local information on population or, or other uh, relevant data. Great. So the next question is the list of countries that adopted the 2030 agenda available online. Yes, it is. Uh, and you can find the link um, in the slides that have been shared. So see the UN member states list. So in the slides from today's presentation, you can find that link available. Our next question, so I think Microsoft just launched urban building footprint data open. How can these data sets be implemented in the SDG initiative? So certainly such efforts like the one led by Microsoft are very relevant uh, since they do come from very high resolution commercial data and therefore provide very detailed information. However, there might be some questions related to the update of such data in the future, especially in terms of their availability in an um, open and free of cost manner. But certainly uh, of, uh, of great relevance and use. RG, if you, if you want, I can, I can also provide an example of how we are using uh, those data on, on our side. Um, when we are creating uh, global data on, on uh, settlement maps and, and uh, building maps, we use this information for training and uh, verification of uh, the results that we obtain from, from uh, free and open um, course or resolution data. Um, but also, if, if you have uh, very specific local questions, like we had uh, earlier on the question on uh, the, the campus uh, sustainability, if the Microsoft data covers your campus, uh, you are ready to go. You have uh, the information that you need at the, at the sufficient uh, spatial resolution. So just give uh, one example. Wonderful. Thank you, Thomas. And I do see that we, we do have... Uh, uh the building footprints for the US, Canada, Uganda, and Tanzania, we, we have a, a link to that, uh, um, to those data sets as part of the, the data catalog since they are provided, they are open access. Um, so you can, you can find that available under data in the toolkit as well. And uh, Arti, again, uh, to, to add on this, uh, recently, I think last week uh, or the, in the last weeks, uh, Microsoft also released uh, a number of uh, data sets for, for Latin American countries. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, great. Uh, question 12, what is SAT SAT models to send statistical information to land centers? Um, I admit I, I do not uh, know the answer to this question. So um, does anybody else on the panel want to take this? Or if not, we will investigate and get back to you. 
okay? How can we downscale the data from a toolkit to a finer local scale? I think we've alluded a bit to that through the discussion about, for example, leveraging some of the commercial higher resolution data sets, uh, um, such as the ones provided by Microsoft that are um, currently open access. Um, in addition, um, as part of the, the toolkit community and effort, we are looking very much to work more with uh, cities and local um, users to, to test and help validate the usability and applicability of some of the global data products included in the toolkit through um, leveraging local information and and i think that that is uh, a key part of the process uh, but let me uh, pause and see thomas or dennis if you want to add to this question yes maybe perhaps to just add on this is one of the things that we are certainly discussing continuously in the toolkit is also the value of in situ data that is coming from uh, from the ground and being contributed by specific organizations such as university projects uh, communities also volunteering their data and this ultimately in the long run has a very important uh, scale aspect uh, that can uh, also link to uh, like that just training data even for the work that uh, thomas is doing uh, with the more global data sets great thank you very much dennis and then question 14, in case of India, the central government provided some vertical sectors, indicators, et cetera, to measure liability at grassroots levels as municipality performance index, but they are for million plus cities and million cities. What method can we apply to measure liability for local level for less than million cities and small towns which are the growing phase and face more problems related to their governance thomas or dennis would you like to take that one yes i can i can at least uh, give it a start um i i, I fully agree that it's it's often a problem uh, that uh, there's a lot of information available for for the big mega cities but uh, often the smaller uh, cities are, are disregarded. However, there's, there's uh, more and more information available really at a truly global scale. And I think if you look into the Earth Observation Toolkit and into um, the, the use cases that are available yet, there, you might, may find some, some inspiration. And uh, just um, combining uh, census information um, with with other data sets, you may be able to come up with with some information that is maybe not exactly the same than what you can find um, um, provided by by the government in the municipality performance index, but uh, something that that also can can help you. I'm here, thinking here about uh, uh, earth observation data on on greenness of the city, for example. This is available uh, globally and you may combine it then uh, with, with uh, information that you have on the open spaces in your city and can come up with, with some indicators that do not match necessarily the SDG indicators, but nevertheless can provide you also some information at the local level. Thank you very much, Thomas. And so I think with this, we will conclude our Q&A session for today. Again, we want to thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week on February 3rd for part two of uh, this training where you will hear from Thomas Kemper as well as um, Cascade Tacholsky, two, two uh, wonderful colleagues, uh, more about some of the specific data and tools uh, that are part of the EU toolkit. Thank you very much for joining us.